I envision a time where we're going to have domes on the moon where people are going to be able to go and pick up their crops as a layover flight to then go to Mars. I truly see this as the future. Imagine Mars having biospheres made of something known as silica aerogel that was made by Harvard scientists and NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory scientists. And it's this cloudy material that was originally used to be the insulator for spacecraft. But it's not too far-fetched to have it be domes on Mars to grow crops. And MOXIE, an instrument on the latest Mars rover, the Perseverance rover, is a material, is an is instrument that can convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. And it's going to be able to do that on Mars. So who knows, maybe within the next five to 10 years, the robots that are already living on Mars will be able to start building these habitable locations for humans to be able to visit. Athena Brensberger is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Athena advocates for space exploration through her platform, Astro Athens, a website, YouTube channel, and various social media platforms pretty much everywhere. People can find do-it-yourself astrophysics demos, rocket launch coverage, and going behind the scenes at events around the world. She's worked with Seeker, Futurism, Ariana Group, and Dexter as a correspondent on all things astronomy and rocket science. With a background in astrophysics and fashion, Athena's mission is to show that space is within all of us. No matter what industry you are in, her research includes work on protoplanetary disks and low mass stars. After giving her first talk on stage, she fell in love with presenting science rather than conducting it. Athena, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm glad you are, and I, I'm glad you gave me the short version of your biography because <laughs> I know there's a lot more to you, a lot more depth and substance that we could uncover, but I'm hopeful that we'll uncover it here on the podcast today. Um, uh, from what I know and have stalked you online because I follow you on many different channels and, and just love what you do and how you present things, I know that you are a person of, of depth and substance of deep thought and you provide quality content and a lot of that content is uh, something that I think we're going to align with and, and we're going to be able to get down into to some rabbit holes, you know, do some deep dives because of that. Um, to, to start out, I would like to kind of see if there's something deeper that comes out because you are a model, you do model, and you um, probably maybe more so in the past, but, but how did that transition come, come about that you went from there to here or is it still in balance with what you're currently doing, kind of also bringing us up to speed to, to where you are today? Yeah, they're both quite harmoniously balanced. Um, coincidentally, I sort of feel, um, and shockingly, because they seem like such opposing industries, you know, the science industry and the fashion industry, but it really has become so intertwined in my life. I've been modeling for about 10 years now, and it first started when I was pursuing dance and theater when I was much younger. I was three years old, the first time I started dancing. So my love for the arts actually came before my love for science. And right around age 16, when I started learning how to track asteroids and maneuver around a, a planetarium, that's when I started to really combine both worlds. Uh, I was studying music and also studying space. And then it just continued into college. And, and then modeling started um, the summer that I was doing research at the Hayden Planetarium uh, under my NASA space grant on the propylids, what you mentioned, protoplanetary disks, which we should totally get into. They're super cool. And um, I got scouted um, for America's Next Top Model while I was working at Aeropostale, 
that like clothing brand store <laughs> yeah, and yeah. was doing that at the same time as my research and taking a accelerated calculus class, which was just crazy. And um, thought maybe I should really pursue this. Maybe I should see where this, where this goes. I was never really too attracted to the fashion industry at first, but my mentors, um, who Dr. Charles Liu was really active in um, musical theater and is a deep cosmologist as well. And so he was like, I think you should pursue it. See where you know, your direction uh, takes you if you were to, to pursue that. Science will always be here. You can do both. And um, yeah, I just took that leap of faith and decided to test it out. And um, it, it set me on this journey of being able to pursue science in a more creative artistic way while pursuing also modeling and acting. And there's things I learned from both industries that allowed me to uh, parlay them into each into each other. That was pretty that, cool. That is fabulous. So I, I first discovered you on TikTok, and that is lately becoming a very controversial platform, mm -hmm. especially for the United States. Um, do you have thoughts or feelings as, as you're monitoring or as you're doing this, what, what your views are that you could share with us and how that journey has gone? I, I, I'm really a big fan of everything Chinese and don't have biases towards anyone in the world, but I think there's some really cool things happening there, but I'd like to get your inside views of, of what your thoughts and feelings are. Yeah, I think the main thing that led to the controversy was like security, um, like concerns with the app. But coming from, I mean, I'm not an app developer, but just having friends that work in IT and develop apps, a lot of apps um, would have almost risky like security concerns that you would think about, but they, it's all really, um, you know, a lot of it's really protected. And, uh, and I think that there was maybe this uh, misunderstanding probably with the app in the US. Um, I'm not 100% certain on what the status currently is of whether it's going to get banned or not. Um, I know that Instagram recently just created something called Reels, which is essentially what TikTok does, but they're trying to make it now for Instagram. But what was so special about TikTok was when I started, it was specifically because they wanted to bring more education to the app. And you have to be very clever to try and like demonstrate science in 60 seconds, but also make it captivating and quick. And so that was the real challenge. And I, I not only loved it for myself, but all the creators I got to see through it, the other science communicators that just took on the app and just made it awesome. And people started doing voiceovers of our own voices, explaining theories and quantum mechanics. And that's what's exciting because TikTok started as kind of a voiceover app and dance competition and music kind of singing app. But the whole point now is that it's become so many, it's gotten so many other layers to uh, just, yeah, to, to the app in general, where now there's other industries participating. And I think that's awesome. It encourages young kids. Yeah, it's beautiful. I like the, the, the way they mix pretty much everything. They address a whole another humong humongous or terrifically big group of people that probably weren't addressed in some other apps before. I've seen Neil Tyson Degrassi, who I'm also a big fan of uh, doing some things on there. And, um, I, I, you know, it's addictive. You, 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 you get on there and uh, you have to be real careful. You could, you could really go down <laughs> some, some um, addiction things for a long time in that path. But uh, I, I I'm, thank you, by the way, for that update, because, you know, I'm, I, I'm a techno lust and kind of a nerdy guy, but it's a conversation and topic on a lot of my listeners that are wondering, what is this TikTok? Uh, uh, where have my kids gone? Why have they disappeared on TikTok? And, and now with what's going on in the U.S., so it's nice to get a little bit of insight of maybe somebody who's doing that. You've seen quite a bit of success from that. During the pandemic. So you've been doing this for a while. You've doing it before the pandemic and you've kind of not only learned about the resiliency that space provides someone, the knowledge of astrophysics and space and going to space and, um, and those things. Are those things that you've also applied into your life and have any of them or speaking about these topics 
prepared you for this pandemic to be a little bit more resilient or, or, or to know how to continue to create content, continue to um, move forward with what you do with success, but also maybe possibly put you in another position to help others or to educate others um, uh, with some, some knowledge to get through this time. Yeah, there's definitely a few aspects there uh, about just the science mindset in general, and then also the applicable form of making, you know, social virtual video content. The first one I want to touch on is kind of that, I guess, more of the, the philosophy of the science mindset and how it's been applicable to me when the pandemic first started. Um, so that was what you, but you were mentioning. And there's something I love sharing, and it's called the overview effect. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and so um, I, there's this extraordinary experience that happens with astronauts when they see Earth for the first time from space. And um, it's almost as if our bodies are not designed to see our own planet from space like that. And it's this unlike world, like, uh, like it's very hard to, to verbalize the sensation as if I've, I haven't even experienced it, but just from, speaking to those that have it's such an extraordinary experience that being able to sort of shift our perspective from what we're seeing every day on like our you know just on our streets and our buildings and our society economics government everything we've built if we removed that for just a moment and saw earth in its totality there is just this absolute pure beauty to it and um, shifting your perspective to that, I think, is, was definitely vital for me, specifically in the beginning um, of the pandemic. And then sharing that with others, I think, has really helped just generally a lot of people. It's, um, so you've heard of it. it is a, I've definitely heard about it. I speak about it all the time. Um, not only is it the overview effect, it's also the cosmic perspective. It's one of profound awe. There's actually only about 500 people who have ever seen our planet live from outer space to date. More coming every day, um, especially with great companies like SpaceX and, and some of the things that are happening that uh, are occurring, uh, giving more opportunities for people to have that. I have um, also not seen it live, this, uh, this overview effect. But I have received that experience in a couple different ways. One, I travel and fly a lot, speak at events, and so I've been on some international flights and kind of had a different view of an overview effect on a long haul flight. I've also seen a lot of satellite and, and drone footage that gives you a pretty high overview effect of some things. But I recently got an Oculus Quest and I, yes, I did. And I, and I, I, as I told you, I have techno lust and I really like technology and, and things, but it gave me the experience of the overview effect, the cosmic perspective, because I did see the earth rise um, um, live uh, from the Apollo mission. They actually, NASA has uploaded not only the moon landing, Apollo 11, but they have done, I believe our Earthrise was Apollo 8 uh, that, mm. that did that. And uh, as they were rounding the moon, and it just by accident happened to see that Earthrise and, and get that feeling. They also have that on the Oculus Quest, plus the ISS station where you can actually yes, I've done that float one. around and you can grab stuff. It's <laughs> absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah. But uh, that it is so realistic it's so 3d with the sound and the, the the vibrations and the feeling it really gives you that awe feeling and so there's there's technologies and, and, and things available to give people that feeling if if they really need it mm -hmm. i believe i had it before i even saw these because i've also always kind of uh, looked at not only maps like this but NASA images a lot. And when I speak in my, um, my presentations on the environment and climate around the world, I, I always be begin with, with two images. One is the Earthrise, December 24th, uh, 1968. And then the blue marble uh, image, 
which was taken uh, just a few years later, the complete image of the Earth. And uh, what I say is, what is this? You know, and people say, well, does that's our planet. And uh, I says, mm -hmm. no, it's innovation. Had we not gone to the moon, had we not sent satellites and, and missions to the moon, had we not looked to outer space and to other planets and to, to space travel and even trying to get to the moon, we would not have these images. We would not have looked back and had those images of our planet, which began the entire environmental movement. And uh, it, it is profound because a lot of environmentalists, tree huggers, they always say, Let, we got to go back to the roots. I hate technology. It's ruining our planet. Uh, in reality, it can be used for good and evil. It can be mm -hmm. used for bad and good. And uh, it was really used not only by Al Gore, by Carl, Carl Sagan and many other fabulous people to really tell us the lifeblood, the pulse and the heartbeat of our planet. And, and that's when I've sp spoken about Earthrise. I hate to go off on a tangent, but that is my connection. And I, th I feel that connection is very important for every human being to have because what we're trying to, to portray is not only that sense of awe and that sense of respect of our only home, but that, that we're all on spaceship Earth. We're all mm -hmm. belong together, that there are no nations and borders. We're all breathing the same air, drinking the same water and moving in the same direction. There is nobody who was dropped off from planet Mars or planet Venus or whatever else. We're all together on this spaceship Earth and we're all crew members. None of us are passengers. There's yeah. a time where we're babies or elderly where we can't contribute as much, but we're all crew members on how our planet turns out and, and will end up over the centuries and years and decades. Um, yeah. So sorry to go off no, on a tangent, but you, okay. like I told you, we can really yeah. get down some, some, some rabbit holes, especially where I am as passionate as well. That's why I, mm -hmm. I jumped on, on, on your, uh, not, not only TikToks, but Instagram and your other channels and your website, because I really mm -hmm. like the way you educate people. I like the way that you present uh, very complex, very difficult to understand things in a nice, simple way, fun. And, and it's just a pleasure to, to listen to you. This does bring me to um, the first question. You know it's coming because I, <laughs> I, I warned you, but um, there's, there's this term, global mm -hmm. citizen, or mm -hmm. planetary citizen now with uh, SpaceX and, and Elon, uh, you know, we're gonna be an interplanetary species and, and things like this. Um, I would like to know how, what your feelings are on global citizenry, being a global citizen, if you feel like one. And secondly, kind of as an add on to that, how would you feel if the future was one without nations, borders, divisions of humanity that we really saw each other all on the same spaceship Earth together without dividing or hating or fighting against each other, like Carl Sagan said in his talk about the pale blue dot. Yeah, so um, to answer that question, I wanna um, branch off of what we were just talking about, Please. about why technology is important for bringing more of a global shift in our consciousness about the, the climate change, but also just about seeing our planet. I get the question a lot about why are we just going to space? Like we're just leaving earth behind. Like, you know, why, why are we doing that when we have so many problems on earth? And my answer is always what you just said about like seeing that perspective, that might be just enough to trigger a whole movement to help those that are still have scarcity of water. Those who are living in poverty, who do not have fresh food and, Sometimes the technology that's developed out of space missions is directly applicable to say what we're facing right now in a pandemic. And um, that would be this, the second part of the question you asked earlier, which was that was what my focus has become during the pandemic for my content creation is what I first mentioned was kind of that philosophy of applying the scientific mindset, but then creating content around that 
to help those who are struggling in quarantine, who are completely alone, isolated from people if they don't have family or roommates at home. And that is something so important to keep in mind. So that directly ties in with a global citizen because yeah, we're all here on this on spaceship earth on the same planet and looking at just how we've grown all together as a species, how we've gained different levels of, mel of melanin in our skin and how we've gotten different like hair and heights and body sizes, all of that is part of the beauty of our evolution and, and all animal life and plant life that's on our planet. And so I love the term global citizen. And about three years ago, I was actually looking into the possibility of knowing if there was a passport I could get as a global citizen passport, because I really wanted to try and get that. I wanted to have like some possibility of just getting like the earth flag as my stamp. And, um, but then as I've, I've grown over the years, past, I mean, this was maybe four years ago, I had the thought, I've started recognizing the beauty of our differences is something to also keep in mind and cherish, to hold on to our different cultures. And my thought on the borders is, is quite like, it, it's kind of like torn because part of me is like, yeah, if we removed all borders, like, I think that would be great because we need to experience other cultures. We need to be immersed, especially children, because children look at things in wonderment rather than criticism or judgment. They look at things with awe and excitement. And they're like, well, why is this person, you know, uh, handling this situation differently or cutting their vegetables differently than this person or than me? And it could be because of, you know, where they were raised to, to cut the type of vegetables or whatever. And then I think, well, maybe if, if, there, if we were to start to look at all of us as like identical, I would, I would, I, I wouldn't want that to remove the beauty of our differences. And um, I think that's the fine line humanity needs to uh, walk along to, to remember when it comes to evolving into this next level of, of equality, because we are equal, but also look at the ways in which we are different as beautiful rather than a determinant of, of like hindering our inequality as it shouldn't hinder equality at all. No, not at but all. it should be cherished. I mean, there's so many beautiful things. I mean, the moment, first time I ever traveled to another country that I didn't speak any of their language and I, I was the quote unquote foreigner that here in the US people say all the time, oh, the foreigner is the foreigner. And I'm like, no, like experience you as the foreigner. Then you'll really understand what it's like to, to be immersed in other, other cultures. We're all human beings and we just speak differently because of our vocal cords. Um, and we, yeah, it's just all, all of that. Um, I'm just, I love it. And I think that we all need to experience that at least once in our lifetime, if not multiple times in our lifetime. That's so beautiful. I'm, I'm glad that you shared that with me. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into that, into that rabbit hole. <clears throat> uh, with, I ask that question to most of my guests, but I don't ever follow it up with uh, what I'm going to tell you now. Carl Sagan said, we are all star stuff. We are made uh, from the interiors of collapsing stars, the, our calcium, our, our iron in our blood, our calcium in our apple pies, and our nitrogen. And, and we are the basic elements of collapsing stars and the basic elements of life are those that are found here on earth that earth is created of. So we are all star stuff and we are all global citizens. We are part of this earth. And um, I, I use a term called um, homo symbiose that we need to kind of evolve from homo sapiens into a, a, a homo symbiose that comes from Professor Chin. Um, who kind of talks about that evolution of humanity, but more so that we become part of a symbiotic earth. And by no means do I mean that we all look the same, we all have, speak the same language or have the same culture as a global citizen, even as a planetary citizen, even as um, uh, someone who has this world citizenry view, 
uh, it's okay to still have your belief, your political views, your religion, your color, your, your religious belief, your non-religious belief, um, but there is this much higher unifying operating system that connects us all as part of the symbiotic earth as global citizens and as distant cousins really because we are all you know connected a lot less than six degrees of separation because we're all really distant cousins and um and crawled out of this primordial soup of humanity you know and, and um how we evolved and and the the beginnings of life on earth really start with those basic elements and bacteria. And the majority of our bodies are, are made up of, of this bacteria. So I am a huge fan of Carl Sagan. If you haven't picked that up yet, or <laughs> you didn't know that with my pre-questioning. And uh, I, I, matter of fact, I just interviewed his daughter on our podcast, uh, uh, Sasha Sagan on Monday. Um, but I, I, I just think that the wisdoms that he provided us, wisdoms that Neil Tyson deGrasse provides us, wisdom that Athena is providing us and evangelizing and uh, making it very entertaining, a new form of modern day cosmos or contact, a new modern day of how we understand our world, how we understand space and, and how that it's all interconnected for me is, is beautiful and I, I, I thank you for that. My question is, with all that that you do and all that you, you've known, how, uh, who is the biggest mentor or influence in your life, doesn't have to be Carl Sagan, but that has <laughs> kind of pushed you or taught you the most or you know, kind of your personal hero, who's helped you on this journey, or has it just been dry books that you've read or, or you know, movies that you've seen or how, how you know, you've, you've kind of got to have a mentor, somebody who mm -hmm. inspires you to do what you're doing. I, I know you do a great job, but there's got to be somebody out there like that. Is there such a person? Yes, 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 100%. Um, I'm always talking about how important it is to have a mentor in whatever field you're in. And uh, for me, it was my first astronomy professor in college, Dr. Charles Liu. I mentioned him earlier, actually, in the beginning of our interview. And he is just so extraordinary. We're still in contact. Uh, we definitely still talk. And he not only was my mentor for my research uh, when I had the NASA space grant at the Hayden Planetarium, but he's the one who I would chat with about like modeling contracts when I went to Korea for the first time. Like we, we would meet up and I would meet his students um, at the Hayden Planetarium or at the College of Staten Island. I'd say hello to all of them, chat and everything and just talk about you know, space. And then we would chat about kind of my next contract in Hong Kong or Korea or wherever. And it was just so awesome because it felt like, I mean, and it still feels like no matter what, it's like I have this, this support, but also like I'm able to um, really go to just someone who's really wise and has d done the things that I am doing and want to do. So he's like published astronomy books is like the most amazing science communicator that I know. I mean, our first day of class, he literally ran into the classroom, jumped on the desk and said, who wants to learn about space? And then took like a spinning stool, put it up there, asked for a volunteer and demonstrated centripetal acceleration. Like by putting the arms out, you know, and you spin slower and then pulling it in and you spin faster. And I remember looking around the classroom and just seeing everyone just, it clicked for them all different like majors as well. Like this was astronomy 101. So for a lot of the students that weren't physics majors, this was like extracurricular for them. And they, I mean, there were art students, business students, all of the above. And they just were like, wow, I just learned something that I never thought I would understand because the name sounds so complicated. And that day I just knew it. I was like, I wanna be able to communicate science the way he does. So yeah, he, my biggest inspiration, um, Dr. Lou, you're awesome. <laughs> great, um, great. Yeah. 
he's great. <laughs> well, he'll definitely hear the shout out, but thank you for sharing that. And yeah. uh, I'm the same way. I, I have some great mentors as well. Um, Al Gore is a mentor of mine. I was one of the first 50 people trained by him in his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee, as a climate speaker and a climate leader. Um, William McDonough, who wrote the book Cradle to Cradle and Upcycling, is, is a friend of mine and has mentored me on many things and many, many other greats. And I believe mentor or even if you never meet them but have read their books or seen their works like Carl Sagan can, can mentor you and you can create a, almost a mastermind by following their works and looking at them to see the passion that they delivered. And it definitely sounds like your mentor had the passion and the way to convene it that made it something that could be very scary or complex, something fun and interesting. And, and that's what I see in you and what you do and, and captivated by the way I, I've, I've watched you do your, your presenting. Um, I, I wanna get into kind of maybe a, a, a side channel a little bit to do with space, but kind of not. So with your modeling, mm -hmm. the big thing in the last uh, five years, at least, if, um, that is really bubbling to the s surface is sustainability in the clothing industry. Not only the, the, the wages that are being produced, the type of fabrics, the type of pollutants, the type of things that go into that and how products are produced and where they're produced. And um, I'd like to know your thoughts and feelings on that and how uh, maybe you have uh, pushed sustainability or thoughts or processes into this industry. And also if, the, if, if you're one of the advocates out there saying, you know, we even though I'm a model, we need to kind of do it different, there's a different, better way to produce and to consume and to have products that don't harm human health and, and wages, but also our environment and our planet. Yeah, completely. Um, I was about, I would say three years ago, the first time it really clicked for me. And um, it's kind of a terrible thought. It was about like, what would happen if my house burned down, which not going with that won't happen. Um, but I just thought, I'm like, would I really miss any of my material items? Do I actually need any of my material items? And the most I could think about was actually my childhood teddy bear, to be honest. Um, everything else I just realized like, wow, all of that is replaceable. As long as my family is safe, that's the most important and to have you know a new um, roof over our head. But that was the moment I realized like, I don't need all this stuff that I've been so absorbed in this consumerism that's put into our, our minds uh, all the time. I mean, we see it on the computers, we see it walking down the street. I mean, everywhere there's just this need and this obsession with constantly purchasing because you think you need more. And uh, that moment, that realization, I just got up and donated like 80% of my belongings. <laughs> um, I remember that specifically we were, um, giving out, uh, it was during winter time and we we're uh, collecting bags for the homeless and we're putting together all the stuff that we could and, and handed it out to them. And ever since then, I just really started looking at my purchases. Um, I started really looking at thrift stores and thought, let me just see what that's like. And then I started really like, this actually is from a thrift store. It's so spacey, which is so cool. I found it at a thrift store, but doing secondhand, um, I started really getting into and then trying to shop sustainable, but realizing that a lot of sustainable brands are so expensive and I'm not quite sure why, um, but I've noticed like even big uh, corporate, like huge companies like H&M have their own section of uh, fabrics that were recycled from people that donated their clothes. So it's called like consciousness, I believe. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I really love that they have that. And being a model, um, especially doing showroom. So showroom is when we're presenting like the newest collection to stores like Macy's and Saks Fifth Avenue for a specific client. Um, and if certain collections don't make the cut, there's all these samples made that just sit in warehouses and eventually, eventually some brands will donate, but a lot of brands don't. 
because they don't want their patterns to be repeated elsewhere or they don't want people to copy them. So a lot of times they'll actually get dumped and those dyes, those fabrics and the human labor that went into it is just such a waste. And um, I realized this about, I would say two years ago, um, the first time I, I actually decided to ask a client of mine, like what it was, what they do with them. I'm not going to mention their name, but after that, I was like, I can't, I personally cannot work with them anymore. And I was like, I just, I was like, it's just, it's just wrong. And um, there's so many other ways that we really could be moving forward. We're so advanced that the fact that we have a device that can talk to us and our phones that are like, you know, tiny little like quantum computers, like all these incredible things. And yet we're still really overdoing it with, with the fashion industry. And um, it just makes me sad because you know, I really started growing an appreciation for like designers and the different stitches and textiles and really looking at how you go to a museum and you see an artwork on the wall and you go to New York Fashion Week and you get to wear that artwork. So that's part of like the human mind that I think we definitely should be preserving as kind of this creative outlet of the fashion industry. But now it's about trying to evolve that beyond our way of thinking the past you know, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, I want to say 100 years, but I'd say, you know, we're, we're sort of really getting bad and like right when polyester, which I believe was fabricated in 1941 and a lot of other man-made materials. And it just, you know, it just started getting a lot worse. So for me, I've just become so avid at looking for brands that are using recycled material um, and I'll go into places and question them. And I'm like, is, is this something that that's used or where are your fabrics made? Otherwise I just will stick to like vintage shops. And um, yeah, and I also think it's kind of fun because you start to th embody like the person that might've been in those clothes before, of course not workout clothes or underwear or anything, but I think it's funny wear a jacket that someone might've been wearing to who knows, like a concert or something. And it's, I think it's quite interesting. Clothing has a much longer lifetime than think we realize and um we don't need so much yeah i i i believe consumerism you know is it plays a big part i believe that more so than the consumerism is the way we produce so if we were to produce affordable clothing with good materials that paid um, people a fair wage that didn't have harmful dyes or chemicals or processes in the way we produce that, that could harm human health or co could harm our environment or planet, uh, there really wouldn't be an issue with it. Really, there, yeah. there really would not be an issue with it because um, no one is being harmed, no harm, no foul. Now, if you produce a product that has a lot of chemicals and pollutes rivers and pollutes uh, human health, or you have a, a, a mother who has a, a daughter or a child or even childhood labor that is producing a product in, in a factory, not earning a fair wage and not allowing their daughter to go to school and what maybe not even being able to go to school themselves uh, at a price to produce a extremely inexpensive garment without good working conditions and a fair wage and and things like that and and we've seen it with all different industries we've seen it in the phone industry as well and 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 the food industry and things like that um, that's really a travesty but what most people don't know is there's a couple ties to space with that concept and that thinking. If you look, mm -hmm. uh, uh, same, the overview effect, if you look at our world from outer space, there is no throw away. Everything that we produce here on this earth remains here. Doesn't matter if you throw it in the oceans or if you burn it, it turns into greenhouse gas and as an emission. If mm. you throw it in a landfill, it remains here to pollute and harm our planet. Now, if we took another way of looking at it, if we produce things that were compostable or that if they were thrown away, wouldn't harm our planet or be a waste of resources, or if that we thought in circular economy principles, 
or efficiency principles kind of cradle to cradle instead of cradle to grave, one-time mm -hmm. usage products, certain type mm -hmm. of, of things, then it would totally flip the switch on that industry. And it's really not the consumers, it's the producers. They shouldn't um, produce products that are one-time use or to be thrown away or that harm our planet or those who produce it in any way. Um, that's a big factor, but where space also comes in, and this is where it also comes in with a lot of other things that we kind of touched on in the beginning, is this resilience. If something can work in space, it's the most efficient, resilient, it can work in the depths of uh, darkness of space, and, and, and um, it's very efficient. We don't want to waste any energy. You don't want to waste any resources. You want to have it be so that it protects you and is safe and can be reused. And that's really why I like uh, SpaceX so so much that they're trying to reuse and repurpose and 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 not totally waste in every aspect. Um, how we travel to space, how we get to Mars, how we do things that it's in a smarter, more efficient way of doing that and those efficiencies that way of thinking how can we do it in the harsh conditions of outer space need to be applied to our planet because we are also locked into our planet earth there is no throw away yeah. and so if we think in those biological cycles and those technical cycles it's so fabulous what we can see that those same principles apply, but it's one that is more sustainable for the future. Yep. Which leads me really, unless you have a comment about that, which leads me into I do. my, okay, go ahead and give your comment the, because the, the <laughs> next is the most hardest question I'm gonna ask you that, that oh, we're man. going to next, but go ahead and make, <laughs> make your yeah. comments on that. Um, the International Space Station is the epitome of recycling. And you made me remember that even their urine, they recycle that into water and everything on the space station. If you've ever watched any of those really long NASA broadcasts that, I mean, like seven hours long um, before like Doug and Bob, uh, they were on the demo two mission through SpaceX, the dragon cargo capsule, sorry, the crew dragon capsule, right before they left the ISS international space station to get onto the capsule, they had to do a whole like, like laundry list of checks of they're like, okay, so you had two lunches, we have two empty lunch bags and uh, we have, you know, four bottles completed or, you know, different objects. And they are so, like you mentioned, efficient with every single thing that has been used. Imagine if we had that mentality with things like just carrying around like a reusable container or carrying around straws. One thing that's kind of been bugging me about the pandemic and I understand for, cleanliness reasons but you know like the the glass that you're using I can't go to my coffee shop anymore and get a, a refill they have to give me single use you know plastic whatever it is so I've really resorted to going to blue bottle coffee because they use those biodegradable cups um, and even the lids and the straws as well both of them are um, completely recyclable and have actually been reused from previous recycled fabrics so that's a really you know positive thing one other thing I'm just going to mention really quickly Perfect. is you reminded Please. me of the dyes, even harmful to our, our own health. Um, I learned that I have this crazy allergy to disperse red 17. I actually am covered in hives right now. It's not too bad, but I'll break out in hives when, I'm, when I come in contact with certain materials, fabrics, and colors. And that alone, like, you know, so many people might say, oh, I have really bad eczema, really bad hives. Look at the things you're using. You know, those chemicals that aren't natural to our human essence, they're not natural to us. We should not be using them. And being in the modeling industry, all the makeup, the hair products, the aerosols, all those things, I'll break out on my head as well, like from certain shoots and I have to go home and immediately get it off. And so my, my makeup bag, I, over the past 10 years has gone from a lot of stuff to now I own one brush, <laughs> like one eyeshadow thing, and then, um, Vaseline for, <laughs> for like my lips and it's it's wonderful and imagine if we just more of us kind of looked at it from that perspective and um thankfully this blue hair dye didn't <laughs> didn't didn't uh, cause any re reaction but it, the brand was actually a vegan brand that um 
has a whole bunch of less chemicals, no formaldehyde, any add-ins and stuff, which is great. Beautiful. But it's interesting. You know, I think it's we're becoming more conscious of this stuff. So. Yeah, we, we have to because there's we only have one planet. And so eventually, yep. you know, we, we, you, the, there's there just, I mean, if we, I don't want to get it too far off on a tangent, but if we kind of refer to what Greta uh, spoke, you know, has been promoting mm -hmm. this, she, she says, why go to school if, if you yourself are not listening to that, what you're trying to educate me in? Why go to school if our politicians are doing a total opposite thing than what you're trying to teach me about our future, about the way the world is and what's going on? Um, then it's not even worth going there. And I think the reason you educate and evangelize and, and talk about the things you do is you want to depart an important message, important wisdom, knowledge to people to, to look at our world, to look at outer space, to look at things a little bit different with a different aspect. And you feel like you're, you know, I, I don't know if that is, is your true purpose or mission, but it's a different perspective that you have that you want to depart to those people to, to actually say, hey, here's a sustainable takeaway. Hopefully this makes your life better. Or maybe I can help you progress a little bit further in your view of the world or life. And, and that, that could help impact somewhere else. And I don't know if that's true. Maybe you've experienced that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do you have like a mission or why or purpose that you, that you say, this is why I do it. This is why I get up and, and create this content because you create content for many platforms and it's a lot of work. Why do, why do you do it? Do you have a purpose, mission, or why? Could you share that with us? Yeah, uh, the overall gist is to just really shift our consciousness on a collective level. And uh, that can sound so broad and crazy and maybe hippy-dippy, but it's really, it's, it's ingraining this more scientific perspective of everything, of our own decisions we make with ourselves, with each other, and with the world that we live in. And I think that if bringing it in a non-intimidating way, which science can be very intimidating at a young age, then we will actually really start to evolve altogether. And I think that that one of the, like the root of evolving through the problems we have today is to just shift the way that we learn at a young age. And like, that's why like since the pandemic started, like I started really becoming so much more passionate and like working with kids and making content specifically for, for younger kids and the youth, because like that really is what's so important right now. I've gotten so many messages from kids saying like, I wish if only you were my science teacher and adults saying, if you were my science teacher, I'd be an astrophysicist or I would look at our world differently or I, you know, I would work harder. I would love more. I, I would treat people differently. I would slow down, not feel like I need to rush ahead of the person next to me on the street. I'd let someone go ahead of me. Like all, all those little moments are sewn into our bigger fabric. So, but the overall answer is, is shifting human consciousness on a collective level. Okay, I'm gonna dive down a little bit of, a, <laughs> of another rabbit hole uh, and delay the, the, the burning question, the difficult question for just a few more moments. You've done some amazing shit. You have seen <laughs> some cool stuff. And during 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 the pandemic, during this uh, lockdown part, uh, my friend and uh, Elon Musk and, and um, other futurists and other leaders who have this resilience, have sustainability, have this big picture of our world and, and how they create things, they were all put in a unique position to help others with respirators, to help others with food and things in need. Uh, Kimball Musk, Elon's brother, he delivered food and did a lot of amazing things, planted trees during this pandemic. But every single Tesla, SpaceX, uh, Cog, uh, uh, his uh, neural net and, and on and on yeah. solar city and whatever else he's working on they continue to have deadlines and operate and work through this pandemic time maybe it was controversial but he met the goals he met the challenges he met the deadlines and you were at 
you, you got to see some things live and experience some stuff. I'd like to hear about that and, and how those experiences were from you because also in that, and I don't know if this was earlier before the pandemic or during, you also saw some things about how to grow food in space and vertical gardens. And I want to hear all about that. I want to hear about those, those uh, uh, cool things. Yeah, um, that's all thanks to an awesome program at NASA. Um, NASA has something called NASA Socials, and they, you should totally apply, and anyone watching should totally apply for the next missions. Now it's all virtual, um, of course, but um, I first heard about it actually about four years ago. It's funny, I've said the number four a lot. About four years ago, a lot of things have started for me, and um, I applied to a mission, and uh, essentially you're going as like media, but social media. So just like how press and media have their own access, we have our own access to social media. And it's not even, it's not for people with like, you know, millions of followers, it's for everyone. I mean, they want to expand this to, you know, uh, like uh, sports players and musicians and artists, like every single person. And um, I got, got accepted. And um, recently, the one that you probably had seen when I went to ex learn about how they grow plants in space was for the final a dragon cargo mission it was right before demo two so right before crew dragon which is with the two astronauts and that was my first spacex launch and it was the beginning of march it was march 3rd and um, i got to go down to florida kennedy space center it was right before uh, limits started hitting i think the u.s right around like march 18th and so um, at this time we were good to go and I got to go inside of the veggie facilities. So we learned all about how they're growing vegetables in space. Now they're growing peppers. Um, and it, it was just, it was extraordinary. And they work with schools as well. So they, it's like citizen astronauts and citizen scientists. They get to collect these, these, this data and information of what they're doing on the ISS and students get to go through the data and then they contribute to NASA. It's extraordinary. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's fabulous. Um, and then I, you know, I watched how how you watched the launch and you saw the experience and things. That that was truly amazing. And thanks for taking us on on that journey. But um, I, 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 you also were were at a loss for words because you had uh, at some moments, not all the time, because I, I could tell it was it's an awe inspiring thing. It's you're in the moment. You're it's so big and it's uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and I really appreciate you taking um, us on that journey. And for all my listeners, I would really recommend that they go to your your videos and your your um, website and everywhere where they can kind of watch watch what happens because it's really nice behind the scenes behind the curtain look at what goes on and the grandeur of it all <coughs> excuse me the the um, whole tie of space and and innovation and the things that go into all that process as you mentioned the crew dragon you know launched and they've since returned and and mm -hmm. um first time in 11 years um that we've had a crewed mission from the u.s where it's not from russia or um uh, go to the iss space station and where we're really getting back into not only the space race but the race for innovation and for technology and and bringing back some things that could really help not only the United States, but our planet as a whole uh, in a lot of ways to live better, to live differently with this resilience here on earth. Some of the tools, if you look at the old Apollo missions or the old space uh, launch missions, and even the current Russian uh, missions that send uh, those up to the ISS, um, their control panels, their instrumentation inside the cockpit is that of, you know, a decade, two decades ago, it's outdated, mm -hmm. it's old. And then when we saw the crew, uh, yeah. crew dragon and there, you know, they have tw screens. <laughs> 12, 12 buttons and touch screen and that's it. It's like the future is here finally. We're, we're getting up to, and a lot of it's automated, even though they have the checklist, there's so much that 
is really taken care of and has securities and redundancy to help them. You probably have a lot more insights into that than I do. I just know enough to be dangerous, but, but I also follow that in, in a lot of respects because I look at it from a different lens. I look at it as a lens of sustainability, a lens of resilience. I look at it as we are all star stuff and stardust and, and that these elements and the way we're made up is so I want to understand that. I also want to know where we want to go into the, into the future. Um, so I don't know if you have any insights that you could share with us on that. And if not, then I'm, I'm going to lead you into another question. Let's go into that big question. Okay. I'm really curious, okay. so I want to know what it is. <laughs> uh, okay. The, this, this, uh, the next question is, is the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? Mm. So right now the future we're living in is with gas masks, social, or our face masks, social mm -hmm. distancing, you know, lockdown, borders, uh, um, things like that. Um, Black Lives Matter, some unrest, Beirut just happened. We've got mm -hmm. unrest in, in um, Belarus, you know, protests and new voting mm -hmm. things. What's the future? Yeah. Um, it's where my mind goes. It's kind of like where you were saying your lens is really on seeing the overall environmental impact and our impact on ourselves and reusability and my lens is really is, is around education. And the first thing that I'm thinking is, is about how this is uh, evolving the young minds of today and the adult minds of the future. Um, so the, as they're going to grow up, because, you know, I think for younger students to sort of see like the problems we're facing today, one with the health problems, but then two with Black Lives Matter, the fact that that's going on when, I mean, I grew up in the melting pot of New York City and um, it was so immersed and integrated that to, to fathom that this is a problem in our system is just, it, it's, it's just so, un, like it's just something that shouldn't even still be going on. And I think for young kids to be processing that is probably just as intense because I'm hoping it's going to really start to shift their minds into saying, we're going to make a difference one day and we're going to start to develop the systems now with this education, with living through these moments to make sure that our kids aren't going to have that. Because right now, I mean, in the sixties is when the ripple effect started and now it, it shouldn't still be going on. We know that it's still going on even before the, the black lives matter movement um, really became as, as, as virtually um, prominent as it is now, um, we knew it was still going on. And the, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that didn't think it was still going on. They're like, well, what do you mean? There's problems? Yes, there's always still been problems with school systems, with looking at each other differently, with uh, payments, with, yeah, like with, with um, payroll, like that should not be something still happening. And yet it is. And I think that Looking at it from an educational standpoint, that's really where um, I think the future is going to evolve with having students seeing how we're going to make this change. I think right now, um, what's unfortunate is starting in end of August and then beginning of September, a lot of students are going to be going back to school and will either have to take turns. So meaning they'll be going to school once every two weeks. Um, I believe that's what it is. That's what my little sister is doing. Um, or when she's at school, it's going to be like a minimum of maybe like four or five kids, I think, like in the classroom total or maybe 10 kids. And, you know, just thinking about kind of the long term effects of that just socially is going to not be really too much of a good thing. But what I'm hopeful about is that the innovation that's going to be developed during this time of either solitude or quarantine is going to be tremendous. I think a lot of people because they're really reflecting on themselves and their lives and their abilities, what they can contribute to the world. I'm hoping a lot of innovation comes out of this because if we look at history, a lot of big companies were developed out of times of, of isolation. 
even some of the greatest writers and thinkers um, of human history comes through moments like this. And so what I'm always talking about with my friends when they're getting really bummed out about this, I'm like, take this time to really go within. And I know that we've been kind of seeing this as uh, sort of like desensitized on social media where they're like, oh, I'm tired of going within. Like, I just want to go drinking. It's like, no, that's not the right way to look at it because like, yeah, we can still kind of do social distant meetups and everything right now, but it's in those moments of not waiting for it all to be over to finally do the thing you're waiting to do. It's to start doing the thing now and start planning for it, whether it's getting a notebook and writing out the ideas. So what I'm hoping for is through all of this, the future, we're going to start seeing a major like innovative shift. And, um, and I hope that for the U S because we're banned from the rest of the world right now from traveling, I hope this will actually wake up a lot of people to recognize that, you know, there is something beautiful about traveling the rest of the planet. Cause there's so many people in the U S that will just never leave. But now that they can't leave, maybe that'll actually reverse psychology with them and make them think maybe I should actually travel now once, once borders are open again and then they could experience that. That's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm a global citizen. I'm actually from, from America as well, but I live in Hamburg, Germany. <clears throat> so I, I found my niche. My mother was German and my father's American. And so I, I picked the place where I feel the most comfortable to live, but I travel quite a bit. So I, I hope those borders come down as well. I, want to unpack a couple other things whether you have comments or insights about those about what you touched upon so the big thing was education the big mm -hmm. thing also was during time of a pandemic or pause or great depression or war there's all sorts of innovations and this humanity tends to rally together with uh, positive ways to change and has an amazing um abilities, not necessarily bounce back's not the right word, but to innovate and to, to come up with some solutions to get us into a, a much more uh, resilient place or a different place for the future. The World Economic Forum is calling it the Great Reset. And uh, I, I truly know and believe that we cannot go back to business as usual and bail out. So we need to have a Great Reset because our current civilization frameworks are not working for humanity. To the two points that you talked about uh, with education and innovation, with education, if you look at a schoolroom, uh, even 10 years ago, or even back in the 1930s, the 1940s, or 1950s, not a lot has changed. Our schoolrooms, our classrooms, the way we instruct, the way we do things, is pretty much the same layout. It's pretty much the same structure. We have some new tools, some new labs, some new computer uh, systems, and maybe a little bit more modern library. But in general, our schools, especially for those in not so fortunate areas or private schools, uh, uh, public schools, hasn't improved much since, since those that my parents went to or even the ones that we went to um, and that is something that needs to get up to speed with our world you would never be okay with driving a car when henry Fer ford first came off the automotive line the first ford you know uh, mm -hmm. car um, or the first cadillac or the first volkswagen um, all those vehicles uh, i think Thank God for Tesla and thank God for people who can innovate and think about what the future of travel and mobility and how we should do it is because that would never fly. We would never still be carrying around a landline or one of those big brick phones. You know, we evolve, but why hasn't it evolved in school and education? And so I believe that your form of educating students and people uh, and I belong to the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which does online graduate level MOOC courses. I think that is a huge step in the right direction to presenting new ways of educating, new ways of uh, transporting important 
materials and facts that are real time that keep us up to speed with the big history and the big vision, the cosmic perspective of, of our world. And so um, that's another thing that ties in with space. It's always, we, we can't go to the spa to space in a Buick or in a Ford Mustang. We, we've got to go mm -hmm. to space with the latest efficiencies, technology, resilience, and, and computing power. Well, why are we still stuck in the dark ages in the way we do education on Earth? And so that shift in consciousness or that paradigm shift in the way we do things we needed to, to learn a lesson from space and those who are in the space race or who are in that business to start applying those technologies and those innovations which you address today because they're out there. Zoom is not that great of a technology, but it's surprising how Zoom has come up to speed with all the other great businesses and performers during this pandemic because they had that platform available and ready to jump at uh, the scenario, but we need to start applying our technologies. Uh, I don't know if you have something to say to that, but I just want, I want to make sure my listeners put those things into perspective because we're, we're too comfortable allowing our children. I, I'm, I have to say I'm a, I'm a grandfather. I have three grandchildren, uh, two granddaughters and a grandson and a granddaughter on the way in November. And I have, oh, yeah, so uh, I have four adult children. So I'm extremely concerned that the education system of today is not up to speed. One of my daughters is actually an educator, uh, a, a teacher and a fabulous educator. And she um, is still living on and operating and doing a lot of the old models. We need to get up to speed. I think it's important for humanity not just the US, but for the entire world. And that's one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The reason I ask you this, this burning question is because we, we need to know what the plan is for the future. So mm -hmm. the, the crew demo and SpaceX that sent the Falcon and the Dragon uh, off and as, as currently continuing to launch and, and to send the Starlink broadband network satellites continually, which is, is that's continuing to progress. But that plan, that mission has been in place for quite some time. It just didn't happen yesterday. They've been working on it for a long time and they've reached and, and met the, the milestones all, well over 10 years, I think, uh, um, yeah. and you probably would know that more. Um, the same thing for that and for other technologies and education and that, there has to be a plan in place. And right now we are a global planet. We are this symbiotic earth, this one spaceship earth. What is the plan for yeah. humanity? What is the plan out there? And that's why, that's why I kind of ask you that question because it's important that we all know what it is so that we can achieve it. And um, the, uh, you might know that I'm a sustainable development goal advocate and I speak about the sustainable development goals because I believe that is uh, the uh, historical precedence. The first time 197 countries came together and agreed upon anything, let alone a global plan to save us and, and create a sustainable infrastructure for our entire world. Um, people don't know it's a historical precedence. They don't know that uh, it's a global moonshot. It's the first ever world's global moonshot. It's hard enough. You're in New York, so you've, you've probably seen some things from the United Nations, that it's hard enough that two countries try to decide on where they're gonna go to lunch, let alone 197 decide on a roadmap for the future by 2030 yeah. and how we're going to get there and how it's going to be a better world than we're in today and, and help us to keep our planet uh, capped at 1.5 degrees of warming in the Paris Agreement. So that's a plan and something I talk about, but where it also ties into space again, which I want, I want to kind of go back to what you said about innovation and education. I come from a generation where 
my visions of the future were Star Trek, were yes. 2001 Space Odyssey, were yep. Star, Star Wars. So they all had to do with sci-fi, some kind of space. But you also mentioned Black Lives Matter and, and, and some, some other things that tie nicely into that. In Star Trek, there was no smoking. They had no currency. They had the Treconomics economy. So there was no currency or, or, or form of monetary system. Yet they had a different type of economy where everybody was educated, had uh, technical jobs clear down to a bar person who serves drinks at a bar. They had the technologies and innovations. And when I watched that, even though it was movie magic, science fiction, it was a whole nother world of the future that was cre created and presented every single week. And in that process, when I watched that, um, it inspired me and said, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd like to live in a world like that where there's interracial couples, uh, interplanetary different species all getting along together and new discoveries, that there's new technologies like a 3D printer and a hollow room and, and you know, tricorders and whatever else the cool gadgets were. All those today, pretty much in one form or the other, have come to fruition. They've been realized through innovation because some engineer, Steve Jobs or somebody saw that and was inspired and said, yeah, that's movie yeah. magic, but I'm going to engineer that. I'm going to make that happen. And one way or another, we've been able to realize that. And so yeah. now, now I'm coming to my point. Today and for the last couple decades, we have not had any TV movie programs or series that I can speak of that show me what the future is going to be like in 2030 and 2050 that are not dystopian. Mm. I don't, I, I can't think of one that says, boy, that that's the future I want to live in because they're all very, very Mad Max, very fighting dark. over resources. Yeah. They're very dark and very dystopian. And so with that education and with that innovation, I think we need to help humanity. And I like how you do it through, through your show and through what you do talking about space. You present a beautiful vision of, of a different type of future. And I think we need more media and content that presents those, those visions. I know you do some stuff with Tribeca Film Festival and, and some other things. That is some media that not only children, but humanity needs. So they say, wow, I want to live in that green, beautiful, clean air, oxygen future. And I'm an engineer, or I'm an architect, or I'm an educator. I'm going to make sure that, that we maybe do it with movie magic at first, but I'm going to start working towards us achieving that. And yeah. that's where the, the, the goal of the sustainable developments, the narrative about talking about it, and educating people so that we can start striving for it. Because right now, if we were to strive on our current models or what we were to strive for what we're currently seeing, it doesn't look good where we're going. It looks yeah. very, very dystopian. There's only a few people like NASA and, and, and um, Tesla and some other great companies that are working on some good futures for a new societal structure, a new way of living that, that, that I, I'm really hopeful of. Yeah, it's really in the mindset, you know, like as, as you're speaking and I'm really thinking about that, it really defends so much of why I do what I do, which is to shift that, that consciousness. What I mean is really that mindset, because if we're looking at films like this that are more destructive as uh, versions of the future, that if we go to space, it's going to be a struggle. It's going to cause this and there's going to be, you know, like, if we are a multi-planetary species, there's going to be wars between the Martians, the space bearers, and the earthlings. And if we, we look at it that way, all we're doing is we're, we're, we're not becoming hopeful for the future. We're um, really stagnating ourselves. Um, a really incredible school that I work with is called Dexter. They're based in Wichita Falls in Texas. And um, their system and their structure is all about the innovation of schools of tomorrow and really focusing on that evolution of bringing a different format of education to students. And you mentioned, the, if you look inside a classroom, 
Um, and it's funny because you were actually saying the same thing that the, the CEO, uh, Michael Arthur Olaya said in an interview that he did about a, about a week ago um, about specifically the structure inside of a school and how to change that and, and how they're changing it. Um, and I've been uh, doing virtual streams with them uh, called the Cosmic Playground, where we do like hands-on activities, learning about space. We made Mars rovers um, and learning about a bunch of things. And it's this interactive feature. I mean, this is again because of COVID, but we're able to, there's a chat going and I'm able to communicate with them and chat with them and bring them on the stream. And we build things in real time and learn about this stuff. And I had a class where there was these students that are only like 12 years old asking the biggest questions in modern day theoretical physics, asking the biggest questions that Stephen Hawking is asking and, and working on these theories together. Students that are like 12 years old, and it's extraordinary and it's because there it is within all of us it is within all of the youth and it's about being able to deliver that in the proper way and um, i really encourage you and everyone to to check out this school dexter because the way that their structure is and the way that they really are are getting on the, the level of the students and realizing the brilliant potential that all students have within um, and learning to bring educators together the way that uh, the way that they should be, like you said, like your daughter, for instance, um, and think about the amazing things she's doing in the classroom, but imagine being able to repeat that and being able to teach the technique that she uses to all these other instructors so that when she's ready to re retire and not teach anymore, other instructors can do what she was able to do. And I think that's what really comes with the infrastructure of planning the educational system of the future is being able to find a way to automate it but be able to take the things that work and then repeat it so that it, this happens in, in every classroom. And it's tough right now with the structure that we have now, just because of, you know, with, with a lot of the teachers, um, you know, I mean, they, they have everything, all the jobs that they, I mean, they have to do, they have to write the curriculum, get the supplies, grade all the, the tests and, and, they, and, then, and then teach the class. And then most of the time they're teaching multiple classes. So it's, it's quite a lot. And my teachers are, from when I was younger, um, or my biggest inspirations and champions, because they were not only able to handle so much, but also, you know, having their own kids as well and helping them with homework. And imagine being able to structure in a way where you have the educators being able to strictly educate and then having the assignments be graded in a different way or creating assignments that are fun. You know, most of the time kids hear the word assignment, they're like, oh, no, no. But now when I do my streams with kids, I'm like, yeah, like, go ahead and like make your thing. And they're like, I'm totally going to do this task. And they're so excited because because it's it's conveyed in an exciting way. And because they think they could do it most of the time, if they don't think they can do it, then that's when there's a fear. So it's been yeah, it's been a, a extraordinary um, working with with this platform virtually and it's just so awesome. And I think that really is the future of, of the school system. I, b I believe we're going to be seeing many, many more things from you that your journey is actually just beginning that uh, um, I hope you remember little old Mark when, when I call you <laughs> in, in a year or two and try to get another podcast or a discussion with me when you're this uh, famous superstar uh, educating our world because I, I really believe that the way you do is, is uh, uh, it's very contagious, it'll spread and, and uh, it's enjoyable to watch you. Is there anything that you can maybe give us some inside views or tips what to expect from the compound Athena, what's coming, what we can look compound. forward to, some things you're, you're are, uh, the, the the uh, pl the sh shuttle shuttle Athena. I'm not sure what the right term is. Uh, the 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 space lab Athena, maybe. I love that. I love all of these these terms that you're you're coining. I think they're all super awesome. Um, right now, my main thing is I I love connecting people as I've we've already discussed in the beginning of our Zoom session, and I want to be able to build that on a much bigger scale where um, there's so many people I've just had the pleasure of meeting over the years um, just in the space industry. And so on my website, I'm building a new feature where I'll be able to connect people around the world to one another within the space community. So um, 
that I'm hopefully going to be releasing quite soon to the public. I definitely want it to be very interactive and fun and educational, um, especially now that we're all virtual. I think um, it can be quite lonely, our, our planet. And I think that finding ways to find your own company, your cosmic company, is a way to do it. And so that's definitely something coming soon. Um, and yeah, continuing with making some like exciting, awesome content um, just around like new space discoveries. That's definitely, um, yeah, something I, I hopefully, I mean, I, I think it's going to be tough to travel, so I won't be able to really go to any launches. Um, my plan this year was to actually go to every single launch, but certainly being able to, um, yeah, just, just cover them as much as I can for, for those who maybe have no idea that they're going on um, and tie that in with, with the fashion industry. So, but the main thing is, is that, that new feature on astroathens.com. Um, I'm really excited. I've created a newsletter that I'm calling the Astro Athens Transmission. Very Star Trek-y. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah, um, and it has like a whole bunch of astronomy history per month. Um, so this day in astronomy history, as well as upcoming launches or meteor showers or discoveries um, that were made. Things you can do to go outside and um, check out uh, either in astronomy or streams to catch that are from NASA or SpaceX. So um, I've just started doing that. It's been really fun actually. So I'm hoping to make it a little bit more interactive in some way. Um, but that's, that's really the main thing right now. I have um, one last request or type of question for you. If you, um, to depart a message or an empowering takeaway, sustainable takeaway for our listeners, something that they could implement that would make their lives better, uh, a word of wisdom or uh, your message that you say, you've got to know this, you've got to hear this, this is going to help you. What would that be? Well, could, could I get you to depart something like that to our listeners and say, dang, I didn't know that, or boy, that was great wisdom. That's really going to help me. And uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check out her website. I'm going to check out her Twitter. I'm going to check out her Instagram. I'm going to check out her, her videos because that's what I need. I'm going to share an affirmation that I actually have written on my wall right behind my computer right now. Um, that I actually just wrote out two days ago. Um, it says, today I embrace my potential to be, do, and have whatever I can dream. And I drew a shooting star underneath it because, you know, potential is one thing, but then to be able to really believe that you can pursue that into creating your actual dream that's when we really can start to make a big difference in our lives and everyone on this planet and everyone in the universe. And I think that the shooting star, it traveled light years throughout interstellar space, breaking apart through our atmosphere, um, really is actually just the meteor, but space rock is, breaks apart. And then as it comes down, starts to disintegrate and then that's when we see that streak and we only see it for a, a quick moment but i think that that since it's traveled so many thousands of miles to arrive here on earth we should recognize as us being very special that we've overcome so many um so many obstacles in evolution to be able to be and live in these extraordinary bodies that we have and that we have life and that we can actually consciously witness life and the universe around us. So I think we have every reason to, to do whatever we can dream. I agree. I, I believe that your path and, and we won't have time to go into it, but I believe your path up until now has been one of, of exponential function. So it's gone wild and crazy, a lot of success. And, and I know it's going to continue in, and really get into that hyperdrive uh, uh, on, on success. I know that you, you're, you're going to do very well. I want to kind of depart my thank you to you and also something that uh, is in alignment with your, 
your affirmation and your vision. Uh, and I say it uh, and talk about it a lot in not only the sustainable development goals, but also when I talk, I'm a big food reformist and talk about food and how it can fix and save our planet. But I, I speak a lot, a lot about how we can make our planet better, how we can mm -hmm. draw down our, our climate uh, uh, crisis and global warming and kind of create these resilient, desirable futures to live in. Um, the, the top way is global food reform. But the second and, and third way is empowering women and empowering girls. It's also one of the sustainable development goals of gender equality. I strongly know and believe that, uh, and that uh, everybody needs to be empowered and have that, but I know that uh, gender inequality, uh, especially for women and girls, has something that is really messed up in our world and needs to be fixed. I believe that you're a powerful woman and you can empower many women and girls with your wisdom and your knowledge and your education. And that's where you'll have the biggest impact of making in a, an innovation and an impact for purpose at bettering our world. And just would like uh, to thank you for that, what you do, but also encourage you to keep going and do it exponentially and touch as many women and girls as you can to, to join in um, astrophysics and astronomy and space and, and to the betterment of our world and future, and especially around the education you do. I uh, thank you very much for your time. And unless you have some other wisdom you want to depart, <laughs> this is it. And I thank you for your time on the sh show and the podcast, Athena. It's been a sheer pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark. And just one thing is um, always breathe through the nose. Don't be a mouth breather. <laughs> There's a lot of research about your breath and how important it is for everything. So I just wanted to share that. Absolutely breathe true. <laughs> yep. Thank you so much, Mark. This was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.